now we okay. okay now let's look at machine learning problems as they can actually arise so basically the context in which this can arise so we first looked at the what can you actually do and now we are basically looking at you know where do those problems arise and the first thing is basically in a non-responsive environment uh, remember that Rhino we'll see another picture of it later so non-responsive basically means that the environment isn't out to get you, isn't out to really do things in an adversarial way or maybe in a cooperative way. Basically, the environment, the world doesn't care about you. You may very well care about the world, but the world doesn't care about you. And this is actually a really good situation usually. So one example is induction. So induction is simply, well, you know, you get the training data set that's maybe drawn IID independently and identically distributed, so it doesn't matter whether observation three happened at time step three or at time step 100, so basically it doesn't re that doesn't matter. And the test data is also drawn ID from the same distribution, but obviously the test data isn't available at training time because otherwise it would be very easy for me to just you know, predict the labels. So this is basically very, very simple. You, know, you read a book and then afterwards somebody sets you an exam. Transduction, the good thing is there, we have the test data, but not the labels, available at training time. So you might think this is not a big deal, but actually if I tell you I'm going to give you the exam questions already now and you can prepare for that, that would be a substantial benefit relative to not having the exam questions now, right? So you, and basically transduction is the same thing in the context of machine learning. Now, when can this happen? Well, for instance, you know, let's say I give you some handwritten digits, annotate, and I give you another document and say, well, okay, after you've done it, you're done with this, annotate this document really well. So you, then you can adjust your model to cater for that really well. Semi-supervised learning, that just means you have a lot of other unlabeled data around, but it's not necessarily that particular set. So that's just like, you have access to you know, the past 10 years of exam questions and you know, basically you can try to do a good job training for the exam. Um, covariate shift, this is basically when the training and the test distribution are a bit different. That can happen, for instance, if, well, let's say the lecturer sets the homework or maybe the TA sets the homework and then the other and another person sets the exam questions. And if they are very different, then doing well in the homework is no guarantee whatsoever to do well in the exams. We will try to avoid this. It's not entirely possible because the time constraints for homework and exam are a little bit different, so the questions will be drawn from a slightly different distribution. But by and large, we will try to avoid this. So don't worry. But I just want to make it a little bit more understandable. Co-training is basically when you have different sets of you know, modalities at once. Let's say you have the video and the text and you're trying to use both to infer. Multitask learning would be you take 10701 and then maybe you take another class on probabilistic graphical models and the hope is that things that you learn for one class will also help you for the other and vice versa. Okay. Let's make this a little bit more concrete. So Suppose I want to build a classifier, right? And I have those two observations. Let's go here, let's go there, right? Then, well, if I wanted to just separate them from each other, the best thing I could do in the absence of knowing any test data would be to draw this green line. And on the other hand, if I knew that I had all those black dots available, this is probably not a separator that I would have picked. I would have probably picked something that, you know, doesn't exactly go through one of the boundaries, right? And as a matter of fact, this is exactly what happens here. This is the transduction solution, and this would be exactly the induction solution. Now, this two half moons problem is extremely contrived and it's pretty much a surefire sign by now that it's not a great paper anymore if they have this on the first page. But, you know, it actually exemplifies quite nicely how 
having additional context about the data can really help you in coming up with better estimates. So covariate shift. This basically means that training and test data are quite different. So let me give you an example, and this was something that happened to people who were professors or had PhDs at least, and uh, they were in a startup, and they were very, very talented people. They were biologists mostly, and you know, biomechanical engineers. So that startup wanted to detect some prostate cancer, and I was consulting for those guys. And they had this habit of measuring first and then coming to me and saying, hey, Alex, can you help us? And so it turned out that it was really easy to get blood samples from sick patients. Just because, well, you know, if you're sick and somebody tells you, well, look, we want to build this test such that other people don't have the same horrible fate as you do, well, most sick people will say, yeah, sure, no problem. Healthier people will be a lot less generous with their data, and they may actually decline. So, and then for ethical reasons, it's also hard, because suppose you measure it and you find out that it might be suspect, do you tell the person and scare him shitless, or do you actually, um, or do you basically not tell them? So there are all sorts of ethical dilemmas about, you know, when you, uh, yeah, basically, when, you know, when you deal with supposedly healthy patients, and so you need consent and all that. And the thing that they decided because they were a startup that was on a university campus, not here at CMU but somewhere else. They basically decided that they would just, you know, go out into to the student union and ask students to donate blood. And yeah, okay, sure, for 10 bucks they would do it because, you know, they were hungry and they probably offered a sandwich. And then they came to me and said, well, look, we took those samples, we measured the blood, and well, can you please, please, uh, you know, build us a classifier to d distinguish those from the sick patients. And so I told him that, well, I would almost certainly be able to get 100% accuracy, and that almost certainly uh, this would be entirely useless. 